Okay, we're live. <clears throat> I've got no update. Other than I got my taxes done. What? I told Jeff last week that I, I wasn't making much progress because I was working on my U.S. taxes. I had to get my <laughs> one of those people that reports my taxes in October, not April. So I'm sending all of my money to um, Joe and Kamala. <laughs> So I'll point out that in the last meeting, I was saying that uh, I had that, that program working that would remap my GPS. And I said, well, I'll just go in and just quickly change it. So instead of, I, I had subscribed to an extra heading uh, topic because I didn't want to screw around with the one that was coming in. It's already got a, a heading quaternion coming into that program. And I'm talking about that GPS ODOM.py program. So it already has a heading coming into it. I thought, well, I don't want to screw around with that, and I'm not, I wouldn't know if it's working right or not, so I just subscribed to, to yet another heading so I could put in either the heading from my IMU or the heading from, I was gener generating one from my, my uh, dual antenna GPS system, so I could, I could pick either one I wanted there, and I kept thinking that if I were just to go in into that program and say, take that heading quaternion that's already there, and break that out and say, what's the yaw value inside of that? That would probably work. <clears throat> and that got me. I, so I thought, okay, I'll just go ahead and make a couple of changes and try that. And I started looking at that. Well, I should move everything around and try to clean up what's there and try to make it work the way I think it should. And that, that was the wrong thing to do because then, then I went down the path of trying to figure out this whole concept between the NED uh, coordinate system and the ENU coordinate system. And I realized I have, I have no idea, you know, where they came up with that or, or what any of that means. I, I understand what comes off the GPS or a compass. You know, that's, to me, that's what I understand. But they said, oh, no, we're going to pick this other format because somebody else uses it. It's kind of like when they pick the right-hand rule as opposed to the left-hand rule as opposed to something else for all the, uh, the stuff in robotics. So I, I was decided to go down that path and I got deep in the trying to figure out all, all this stuff out and got it kind of got lost and kind of lost interest in everything quite quite frankly so let's see what was the other thing i was doing um can i ask though and that's going to be one a question to you though that's related one does your platform do you guys have a simulator in your platform can you simulate driving your platform you're asking me? Yes. Yes. The, the, you're asking me about the, the, my robot or the robot that I'm, the new robot that, that I'm working? Either one, because I'm, I'm, the question is going to be when you're driving it east as the compass, uh, when you're driving east as the human readable compass says, does the heading say zero or 90? Uh, I don't know. Uh, because I, I, well, first of all, in the, in the two platforms, we got the, the, the simulator. Uh, we use the Gazebo and the Airbus in the two platforms. The, the second question, I'm not sure uh, about that, uh, and because I I, I didn't ex uh, get to the point that uh, to how can I explain the to try to clean up the heading data. Uh, the main problem that I was having was that I wasn't receiving heading data, uh, so. After I received the, I saw the, the heading data, the, the problem was, I'm not sure because I, I wasn't able to come back to that, was that every time 
that I, I, I launched the simulation, I wasn't getting the, the same uh, heading. And that's not right because, uh, but I come to the conclusion that was because I get mixed up the launch files of my of my robot and the simulation because I was using the the real GPS inside the simulation. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not I... sure if I'm being able uh, later when I, when I was uh, translating the uh, the articles in the wiki. Uh, I found out that there are a lot of uh, things that you can do with the heading inside the launch files. And maybe uh, I, I thought that the, the best solution was to fix, uh, to give a fixed heading to the uh, when you're launching, not leaving that to the, to solve it with the data that you're receiving from the GPS. And Jeff, then, what? No, I apologies. Go ahead. Uh, and, and then, uh, as the GPS begin uh, giving data, uh, you will uh, correct that uh, heading. Jeff, where I was trying to, I was sort of hoping that there was another simulator besides the Ross Agricultural Simulator that was maybe out there that could be used as a place to quickly answer the question, what, what sort of results are being output in a simulator that would answer, you know, th that sort of question, what, um, what, what heading output if, if is being uh, output from a simulator anyway. Um, but in yes, those, in those formats, the answer of that is yes. What I haven't seen, though, is a simulator that reliably is simulating working in an outdoor environment with a GPS. The, the one that I got the, to, to the other project, uh, yes, because it's simulating the GPS too. It's another Docker file as, as, as not as the same. Uh, it's similar to the one that got the move base flex. Uh, you don't get the, the Ubuntu desktop. Um, and let me show you, I don't know. The problem is that always that I'm launching a Docker, my Zoom crash. And that's why, I, so I will try to do it. And if you see that I get like this, it's like uh, my, my, Zoom, my Zoom crash. So go on and I will try to launch up the simulator in the other. Uh... Back to you, Jeff, you had the floor. Well, I think the position where I'm at, I want to Output the stuff the way it says it wants to, and then look at it on Arviz and look at it with Plot Juggler and whatever direction it's going. I'll have to assume that's what I have to live with, and it could be that um, that everything everything will work itself out if I just get over this fact that you know I want to see North going up on my screen, but that might not be the case, and it might just be a matter of you know actually when I'm plotting the data, it could be that instead of swapping values. So I've got north going straight up that if it wants to see uh, zero degrees going east, it, it could be that I, I, had, I had swapped something ahead of time to make it look li like what I wanted to. And it's just a matter of figuring out. Because <clears throat> a long time ago, I said, I know that the GPS puts out the NE, what is it, NED format and everybody else wants to use or somewhere down the line, it uses that E and U format. I didn't know where that was happening. So like last night when I was digging through stuff, I finally came to the conclusion, the only place to use the NED format is the actual latitude and longitude, which technically that's not, 
that that's not anything to do with the orientation. I think this this whole concept of the NED versus the ENU is just for orientation data. And it turns out that, so I, I think the only place to use the NED data is if you're trying to correct your GPS location on your vehicle. So I think coming off the G GPS driver, I need to take that heading in NED format and move my antenna where it's supposed to be and then publish everything else in uh, this E and E and U format. So that, that way I have to make sure my, my, my wheel odometry is in that format, my IMU is in that format and just simply go down that path and see, see where that gets me. It just want to go to plot the data. If I plot it in plot juggler, you know, what's it going to look like and what direction is it going to go and so forth. And then same, same thing in RVIS. I fired up RVIS last night watching that. And it, it, it's just a matter of figuring out, you know, on the screen in RVIS, you know, what direction is what, if I'm trying to compare it to the actual world. So I think it's just a matter of, you know, having it put out the data that it wants to, and then I have to look at it and in my mind say, okay, that's the way it's got to be. And I got to quit going back to the, uh, you know, my, my standard compass heading, because that's not apparently what Ross wants to use. <clears throat> so it's just a matter of me looking at it and saying, okay, that's what they want. So that's what, that's what I'm going to use. I guess that's kind of where I'm at right now. And just another point I want to make. Uh, so, so as I was looking at this stuff, if you look at the GPS ODOM Pi program, it subscribes to the GPS fix and it gives it a latitude and a longitude. And those are, you know, lined up with the, the earth because that's, that's just the whole concept. You know, latitude and longitude is within reference to the earth. So it takes that in and you can subtract off your offset and get an offset in meters. So you get an X, Y offset in meters from your origin. Now, I'm not sure which direction that X and Y should go, but, but it, it gives you that. And then I was, I was thinking, well, it takes in the heading and does something with that. Well, if you look at that program, the heading coming in doesn't get used with the latitude and longitude at all. It's simply uh, appended to your outgoing odom odometry topic and your outgoing transform. So, and then the question is, does anybody actually use that? Because you can probably you know, feed in the heading in either format into that. And if you're not actually looking at it, well, it gets passed through and stuck in your odometry message, for instance. And if you never look at that, then you may not, uh, it, it may be completely backwards, but if you're not using it, you don't care. And there's a lot of things in ROS like that. Like, like you look at the IMU and it gives you, you know, the, the standard IMU puts out three different topics. It puts out the, uh, the orientation, which would be you could use for a compass heading if you want to. Actually, the orientation and like pitch roll and yaw, I think is what it puts out. And then it puts out the gyroscope rotational values. And I think it puts out the accelerometer values. And they don't, the, the standard method doesn't put out any of the magnetic data, I don't think. But the, the problem is, or not the, not the problem, but just the point is you have an IMU device generating these topics. And it's up to you if you want to use those or not. So it could be the coming off your IMU. The simplest thing, if you have an IMU that works and has a magnetometer, you might want to just pull your, your heading off from that and ignore everything else that's there. Now, if you're feeding it into something like the lo robot localization EKF, you might want to just pull off, say, your, your rotational velocity around your, around your Z axis. So you just want to know how... It, it, it's going to generate your heading instead of your IMU generating the heading. And if you wanted to, you could pull off just one of the accelerations to use for something or all three of the accelerations. But there's more, the, the point is there's more data there than, than what people are using. And if you go read through the tutorials, it says, oh, we're, we, we always use this and this and this. Well, but there's more data there than that. So it, you do have the option. If you wanted to, you could use it for something else too. So again, back to my point on visualization, if you take that GPS ODOM Pi program and run it, it puts out, it gives you an X, Y location where you are. And then along with that, there's uh, the information for heading. But if you're not using that heading, you may not even be, be displaying it on the screen. So it could be that it's completely wrong and nobody nobody knows, but and it could be that, that 
the way everything's set up right now, people are using that heading and I just haven't, haven't noticed that, but so it's just more, more stuff that, you know, that's something that just gets passed through the heading comes in it, it gets appended to the messages and passed through. And if you're not actually looking for it, you may not know what that's actually doing. So I, I guess the point is if you fire that up in RViz and say plot the odometry message, it will show you your X, Y location on the screen. And then it does show you the arrows of where it thinks, what it thinks the heading value inside of that message is. And, you know, anytime I look at it, it seems, seems reasonable, I guess, by looking at that. And I guess one thing I could try is just swap the two messages coming in and you pick the, the one directly from, and, and it turns out my GPS driver puts out both NED and ENU formats, depending which messages you look at. And if you look at the uh, the wiki for that, it I think one place it says, oh, this value is in ENU format because that's why Ross wants it. And then I was doing some more digging. There's another message they've converted, but they didn't bother to tell you that. And I'm looking at the NEMA NAVSAT driver. They didn't, they didn't attempt to convert anything. So if you got, I think you've got any heading coming out of the NEMA NAVSAT driver, that's all NED format. And it turns out that if you want to, want to remap your GPS like I was trying to do, that's the format you want anyway. So it could be that, you know, you just merge those things together. And then if you want a GPS heading for anything else, then it should be in the, the ENU format that all the other nodes are expecting. So it's just, it's just a matter of trying to figure out, you know, what's, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate and who's using what. And so I, I just need to try it, I guess. I, I did find another, when I was digging last night, I was looking for, I typed in Ross uh, odometry frames or something like that. <clears throat> I found this one page where a guy was saying it was on Ross Answers. Yeah, Ross Answers website. And he said, my, my data doesn't look right. And he was saying something about his odometry doesn't line up with the other stuff that he had. And he posted all of his configuration files and and some guy came back and said, oh, well, that's exactly what it's supposed to be doing. And he, and then somebody pl uh, put out a plot that showed a driving in a rectangle and said, I think specifically they're talking about turtle bot. So the turtle bot was lined up with the grid on RViz. So it was, it was driving out like four meters, and then drove in a square. <clears throat> and then there was another plot right there on top of it that it started at the same origin point. So both, both rectangles were at the same point, but this was rotated like 45 or 56 degrees or something. And the guy says, oh, that's completely normal because the, the, the odometry, when you start it up, doesn't have any reference to where north is or where east is or anything like that. So it, when it starts up, it just starts driving forward. So whatever direction it thought was the front of the vehicle when you started it, that's what it's going to show you. But then the other one, which was the... Uh, I think it was wheel odometry, you know, it was the, the, the output of the robot localization. He was saying that, but that one will be correct because it knows where your north direction is. So that's merging various things together to come up with that. And I, I was thinking in the past that if I were to uh, modify my odometry, my wheel odometry, so I could say load in your initial uh, location. So the, it knows it's X, X location, Y location, and it's heading. And by default, if you just start the thing up, those are all zeros. So whatever direction your vehicle is pointing, that it treats that as zero and a uh, location of X, X and Y of zero, zero. And then as soon as you start moving, that starts increasing, but it's not referenced to anything else that, that's going on. So I thought, well, you could just load that in. When I first start, I could go out to my GPS and or my IMU and pull up my X, Y location where it thinks where I'm at and pull up my heading that thinks where it's at and load that into the odometry message. And if nothing else, that would be great for when you go to plot it. So you start off with everything lined up in the right direction. And as you drive, they should be tracking each other. So anyway, it, that's the first time I saw somebody confirm the fact that, oh, it's supposed to work that way. It's not. Um, those two are not supposed to line up. And he kept calling that a quirk of Ross or he had he had some funny funny phrase about he says well it's that's just the way Ross works and apparently everybody thinks that's that's okay that your odometry doesn't if you plot odometry with anything else they they won't necessarily line up so that's just an interesting thing that I found 
it makes it sound like there's no absolute north. Uh, as far as wheel odometry is considered, there, there isn't. It's just whatever direction you point it to start with, that's what it starts. It just starts tracking from that point. But see, that comes back to the fact that if you go look at robot localization, they, there's a little line in there that says, if your wheel odometry puts out uh, rotational velocity and heading, you should use, if it puts out both of those, then you should use, you should input, I think it was the rotational velocity from that is what you should use. And then it says from your IMU, if it puts out, you know, a couple, he again listed a couple of things that he said, if it puts both of those out, you should pick this one. And so again, they're picking and choosing what they want to feed into this filter to make it do that. And the other thing that comes up, people talk about robot localization, and it, it's hard to find this, but if you find somebody's blog entry or somebody's question, it turns out that on the robot localization, it says they want to feed in the IMU to get your absolute north reference. And then you feed in the GPS to keep track of where you're going. But it says, I think the, the very first value you, you send in, it just latches that. So technically, I think it doesn't use the IMU heading anything other than just to initialize the thing. So it says, okay, I started up, I pointed this direction, it loads that in. And it, I think it said once the GPS messages start coming in, that it automatically starts tracking and it knows where north is regardless of your IMU. And that you know, a couple of places I, I've seen somebody say that and I, over the years I thought that might be the case. So that, that technically means you don't need your, your IMU at all you know, once, once that robot localization kicks in and starts tracking where you're going, unless you lose your signal. That, it always comes back to that. Well, what if you drive under a tree and you lose your GPS signal? <clears throat> then theoretically, this robot localization can take your wheel odometry and your IMU and keep tracking where it thinks you're supposed to be going, even if you don't have a GPS signal. So that's just more stuff to, to think about, <clears throat> think about and play with, so. So, so this week, while I haven't been getting anything done other than digging, I, I keep running across these little tidbits that I, I try to make note of that and then try to decide if that is important what, to what, me. I didn't understand what you say this week. Well, the, this week, I, I should have got a lot done this week, but instead I just sat in front of my computer and was digging, digging and digging for more information, trying to figure out, you know, how does the headings work and one one type of heading is opposite from the other so I, that, that's what i did this week was spent all my time just digging through websites looking for more information and then another thing just last night when i was i think digging for the same kind of stuff i came across Mount, matt sadowski's uh blog he's the guy that writes that uh, weekly robot uh, newsletter that comes out on like friday mornings and uh he's got one he said oh i got i just got the two where he, he actually got the, the, the kit from RG Simple that's got the F9P receivers. So it's the same receivers I'm running, but he bought the extra little module to plug on top. So he's technically got three receivers. He, uses, he sets one up as a base station. And then on the vehicle, he's got the, the main board and he's got the, then the little board plugs in on top of that. So he's got two, two receivers there. So he's running the dual antenna system. And I, I simply have two big boards. He's got a big board and a little board, but he was saying, well, he wanted to, as, as the simplest thing, he just wants to show using the GPS only into that robot localization program. And he, he basically went through and, and took the, the, fix, the fix message because he took his uh, GPS and he ran it through that uh, <clears throat> NAVSAT transform program. And the NAVSAT pro transfer, tr NAVSAT trans, whatever that that program that program that that supplied that's meant it's does the same thing as gps odom does so it takes in your fix and it takes in a heading and you can also put in imu no let's see how does that one work that that that's just one of the, the converter programs if you want to run gps with robot localization they say start up that node and it will convert your gps into something that the uh that robot localization understands. So it converts it into an odometry message, just like GPS ODOM is doing. Uh, let's see, now I, I lost track of what I was talking about there. Uh, uh, uh. Anyway, so he said uh, he, wanted to, he wanted to show the simplest form where he just uses his GPS only to generate the data coming out of this thing. And 
he said he didn't have an IMU, he didn't have an IMU input, so he's using the uh, essentially the static baseline from his dual antenna GPS as his heading. And so he's feeding in the, the latitude and longitude, and then he's feeding in his fixed heading, which is always valid. And then he fed that into his robot localization, and he was pretty happy with the results that he was getting. But he made a comment, and he said something about, oh, it, it's not completely right, because if you're running an IMU, you have a, a fixed heading or a continuous. He, he used some phrase on that meaning that, yes, the IMU thinks this direction is north, so we should trust it. But he was saying his, his dual antenna uh, heading coming out, he says, oh, but that's just a relative value, so that's not always correct, which on mine, yes, that's, that's the one that I trust. That, that's, that's my north reference. And if I compare that to my BNO55 um, IMU and plot that heading, those two track right on top of each other. So I'm not sure why he he thought the one coming out of the GPS was just a relative heading. It, it, it is relative to your, you, you got the two receivers, the two antennas, you know, a meter apart. Well, yeah, the one is relative to the other one, but still that, that gives you a fix based on um, not, not magnetic north. It gives you based on whatever GPS thinks north is. So that, that was another odd thing I ran across. But, but right there, he just showed a, a, a couple of launch files and he showed the, the, uh, robot localization initialization file. So he had it trimmed down to the point where if you just feed GPS into that node, it will give you give you what you want coming out of the thing. So I might I might go down that path and, and try his example and see. I should have I, I definitely have everything it takes to do that, and that way I would have an output from um, this robot localization the the Kalman filter output. So that that's something else I might I might try. I'm trying to find that post, Jeff. Could you help me here, man? Uh, I'm look. Is it at? Was it at weeklyrobotics.com? No, he's got his own his own blog, and I don't remember what it was called. And it it's on my other computer, so I don't have a handy here, so I can't just can't just pull it up. I was looking at. I I can find that later and post it to the to Slack. So people will have it. Maybe I found the wrong Matt Sadowski. <clears throat> There's an Ardu Simple Rover. Oh, but that's that's is that is that the one where he says he's playing with the GPS or is that something else? Test Ross package to work with F9P based Ardu Simple RTK. That's probably the one. It's it's a GitHub repository. Oh, um, look, look right in his description for that. And, and, you know, like down the bottom where he says, read me, he might say, oh, it's also documented on this blog. He might tell you there. Looking. But yes, that is the code that goes along with, uh, with that uh, page. <clears throat> I see you posted. I can go look at it here. Wow. Oh, there is no uh, read me. But I, I can post that later. I'll, you know, I can just pull it up on their computer and I'll have it right there. So, <clears throat> and that that also answers the question. I kept thinking, well, can you use the robot localization and use that uh, the, the the that transform program, whatever that's called? <laughs> I, I, did he call it the the Navset transform <laughs> node? Is what it does the conversion. I, I kept wondering, can you use that without wheel odometry and without IMU? And apparently what he said there, yes, you can do that. It gives you the, the steps in order to make that work. <clears throat> cool. And then you still, yeah, have the, you still have the question when you're done, is the output going, the, turning in the right direction? So, you know, you, there's one person saying, yes, it works. And here's the results I got. But you know the, the question you always have then is that right? And so you got to go do more digging to see if you can find you know three or four examples. But if, if they based it on their results based on the first example they found, it could be they're all doing it the wrong way or they'll all do it the right way. So that's that's uh oh. I'm still here. 
my, my lights just flashed and oh, okay, just my monitor went down. So my monitor reset. Um, so what, what was I just saying? Um, whether or not the stuff's right. Yeah, you were basically just saying whether it's the right way or the wrong way, I was gonna make the point that, and then it sounds again, maybe about beating a dead horse, but if you had a simulator that you trusted that basically represented reality of operating an Ackerman vehicle in a GPS outdoor environment, that's true, but how, how do you know you can trust it? See, well, that's, again, that's, that's, the, that's the next problem. Right. Uh, that's, that's why I was um, hoping Juan had that problem solved. That's why I asked the question. <laughs> no, no, no. Firstly, the other robot is not Ackerman. Uh, oh. And, and as I was checking, and whether it is Ackerman or not should should not affect what we're no. questioning right now. It's just a matter of what direction is it going to go in and how's that display going? Mm. Yes, but it doesn't have the GPS. I was wrong. It's getting uh, I'm it doesn't have the GPS. This is something that I need to, to ask the guys to mm, I'm, I'm listening the fan of my computer. I think that two, two more minutes and it, it will crash. <laughs> so, but as you see, oh. But my immediate problem really has nothing to do with GPS. I just want to know when I display it either on RViz or display it with Plot Juggler, you know, what's it going to look like? So if I say drive in this direction, how, how's that going to plot out? <clears throat> and as far as a simulator, you know, I will if try to, I will try to plot it uh, because one of the, the tasks I the plot like you do and I'll do, because I didn't use, uh, I never used the plot. You never use plot juggler? No. no it's I, very easy. I, I Arduino plotter. Uh, a month ago or two months ago, while we were, while we were working with the sensors and try to understand the data, but I didn't, uh, I never used the plot in the, only when I was trying to build the, the, the trials for the robot, uh, that was the only case that I used the plotter. But for that, and I want to use it to get the information like, like Chef does with the long array of data, because I, I think that that's a very good idea. Um, uh, and, I can, uh, and I want to, to, to get more handy. I, I will stop sharing because. Yeah, you are breaking up. <clears throat> Or you could turn video yes. off. Yes. So if you decide to output all your data as an array, what 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 would help right up front is let's see if I can get my screen sharing to work here. Um, this one. A after a certain point, you should go to your source code and write down what the array name is and write down all the entries in it. Because otherwise, a month later, you've got, you've got, say in this case, you got 20 values. You have no idea what any of them are. So, so yesterday or the day before, I went through and, and wrote down one of my STM32 array, all the values coming out. This is all my dig key This is all my dig key Seem to be getting a lot of echo here too for some reason. Seem to be getting a lot of echo here too for some reason. 
Maybe somebody has more than one microphone turned on. Uh, what do I know? So then, then from my BNO 55, here's here's uh, 21 values for that one, and here's my my other IMU. So if you don't write that down right up front, then you keep thinking, oh, which value is which? So it's it, it's a quick way to get a lot of data out of a device and published as a ROS topic. But you come back and look at it, and you don't know what the you don't know what the fields are. And the other thing to keep in mind is you add things onto it. Always add them onto the end. So the number keeps getting bigger and the new stuff will be at the end. You don't, you don't mess around with the order of this stuff. And on mine, I think I've got an extra, there's actually an extra field in here that got deleted and I shouldn't have done that. It's just as you keep adding, adding stuff onto the end and then just simply don't delete stuff. And then three months from now, when you go look at it, you, you should be able to look at your chart and figure out, figure out what the values are. So I had to stop and do that because I was just at the point why I didn't know what any of the stuff was anymore. So that's just a just a word of warning that if you do that, that'll that'll help out. <clears throat> so it, well, it comes back to the point if if I'm willing to trust a simulator, if I just go to the construct where their whole thing is based on their simulator. So they've got all these things saying, oh, we're going to do, you know, they, they did the two special episodes for Ross Agriculture. They said, oh, here's how you use a GPS on your outdoor vehicle. And they fired up the simulator and showed it driving around. Now, if, if I trust that, I'll say, well, if it looks like that on his RVIS screen in the video, then that's what, the way it should look on mine. And I do notice that the construct has multiple you know, again and again and again, they're saying, how do you use GPS on a vehicle? And they, he just pulls up the examples that he finds on the internet and presents those. And I'm not sure, you know, how accurate that stuff is, but it's, it, it's yet, yet one more reference that I can, you know, I plot mine and say, it looks like this and then compare it to his. And there, there's various, uh, various other places you can find where somebody has plotted the results of trying to get their GPS or just their vehicle in general, because it's really not a GPS problem. It's just that if you point your vehicle east and you drive, you know what's what's it going to look like an RVIS? You know which what direction is it going to go on the screen? And if I plot that with Plot Juggler, because you you can plot the latitude and longitude, and then you can plot the extracted X Y offset out of GPS ODOM, and there's there's just various things you can look at there. So then. You know, and the IMU does not put out an XY location, but it puts out what it thinks is the heading and then is compare that to say your odometry heading. So just comparing all this stuff together and deciding what's going to look like on the screen. And if I get them all on the same format, then regardless of what it looks like, I'm going to say, yes, that's correct. And, you know, make my individual pieces work together so that all comes out, all comes out right. Yeah, my... I haven't come across a simulator that has wheel odometry and an IMU and a GPS. So when you say they and simulator in the same sentence, what do you recall which one you're referring to? Uh, from the construct, it's those ones that said, this is the special Saturday episode of Ross Agriculture doing uh, GPS navigation outdoors. So it's, that's, um, that's the very first one that they put out saying, here's how you use GPS with an off-road vehicle. I think that was the, and there was two episodes that we did, and those pop up almost immediately on YouTube if you go search for this stuff. And then later on, he's showing you with other other robots basically doing the same thing. And some of them are saying it, it's actually hard to find one that says this is GPS only because everybody wants to take the examples. It takes GPS, wheel odometry and IMU and fuses all those together and comes up with the results. So that's why when I found that thing from Matt Sadowski where he's using just GPS, that, that seems like a breakthrough there. The fact that he got that to work and if you happen to be running a dual antenna GPS system, that gives you everything you need. You've got your latitude, right. longitude, and a, a heading that's always valid. You feed those in, and you could just use those directly. In fact, uh, essentially, that's what I was doing on mine with my GPS ODOM, because I didn't have a node publishing that heading quaternion. And then I later realized, oh, that's coming right out of that Neiman Navisat driver. 
So that's why I was asking you where that was coming from on yours, but I didn't have that. So I created a slash heading quaternion and I can pass in either my IMU heading or my static heading from my GPS. So technically, you know, I can feed in the, the latitude and longitude and the heading for my GPS and it generates that odometry message all based off the GPS. And, you know, it seems, seems reasonable. It seems like it's doing the same thing. So I have not then added on the, like the robot localization stuff. This is just simply telling me where, where I am in the world and what direction I'm pointed. And I can plot that and look at it and I'm happy with that. But now it's just a matter of if I move on to what Ross wants to see with the robot localization, then I, I would probably switch back over to that. Uh, instead of GPS ODOM, I would probably switch over to uh, the NAVSAT transform program and then if you use the NAVSAT transform and the robot localization together, uh, that's the one that, that said, well, it just it needs an initial heading. So you take that from the IMU. Well, if I'm getting that from my static heading, I don't, I don't care. Or if I have something that says, once I start moving, actually it says, even if you don't provide it with a heading, once you start driving, the GPS starts updating and it will automatically you know, figure out where your heading is and maintain that heading. And what was my other point there? Uh, uh, oh, I, again, I lost track of where I was going with that. Well, if you could find the, the I mean, if he has a GPS only, argue simple, plug and play RTK 17, I'm looking at, Found another website from him. That'd be awesome. I'm wondering what version of Ross he was using. Uh, I think he was running Noetic at the time. I'm not sure that it, it really matters. Well, it, it actually that would be get me away from um, what's becoming an unstable version of the ubiquity robot. <clears throat> yeah, I think this might be, we'll see. I'm gonna post what I think. Let's we'll see if later you find one and see if it matches this. You know, that's that's the page there that I was following. And see, on yours, you don't have a dual antenna GPS to get your heading, but you could just feed in the IMU heading. And whether it uses that all the time or not, anyway, that would, would get you around that. So uh, you'd have to go through his file down there where he says, you know, we're inputting. Uh, you scroll down where it says... Uh, I thought he had them right on this page. I don't see it now. Yeah, there it is. Those, those black boxes saying here's a... Uh, well, this, is, this isn't the complete thing. If you go back to that GitHub that you had, if you look there, he's got... You, you dig. I think it's under config directory. And under there, he says, uh, here's a launch file to start the whole thing. And he gives a configuration file for... I think it's the, the, the NavSat transform node and he's got one for his robot localization node and basically you could swap and put the uh the imu heading into that instead of the heading from the dual antenna gps and if if indeed it doesn't use that afterwards then you're okay but but the whole the whole thing i was thinking of you know it it he was doing it all without an imu or without wheel odometry which was that that's the main point that i that i took from that because again, you go watch all the tutorials and they, they just assume you're going to merge all that stuff together every time. So they say, this is the way to do it, which I guess if they, if you have all that stuff and it's all working, then that, that should work out for you. That's crazy simple. <clears throat> and the other thing, if you go look at this uh, one that says, uh, I'm at this. Uh, there was a different directory. Oh, I'll go up one level and look under a config. So if you look under his uh, EKF RG simple YAML file, and it's, it 
go, go down a couple more lines. And that's that's the entire thing he's putting into it. If you go look at the uh, um, the big examples, you know, this this is like 20 pages long that they put all this stuff in here. So he's got to trim down to the point where it's just using something simple. Uh, also, where he says GPS nav heading, this comes back to my 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 point that out of the F9P driver, there there is a topic called nav heading, and that is one that they've converted to the E and U format. Yet, if you go read it out of the uh, the original place, it comes out of the nav rail pause heading. That one's in the NED format, so you can get both formats out of this thing. And he's he picked the one that's the E and U format, which is what the uh, that's what the software, the robot localization software, wants to see is the E and U format. And that's why it goes back to my 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 point that I just need to get a, get away from the NED format completely. Other than, excuse me, if I if I just want to view it on Plot Juggler, I might want to look at that just so it makes sense to me. But then everything else just needs to be converted to uh, E and U, and you you do whatever Ross wants to do with it. I think. But this does look like a complete example. If you happen to have that those same boards that he bought, it would drop right in and run. And technically, if, if I would take my boards. It should run with, with what I have. It's just simply you know packaged differently. So it this this technically should run with what I have. And that that right there might be a good a good way to do it. Just load this code up and take my robot outside and drive it and see what angle everything's driving at, if everybody's happy or not. Well, but what I'm looking for, how do you know whether this is uh, Ackerman steering or some other kind of it I believe it doesn't matter he just had two antennas stuck on his car was driving around the neighborhood so you don't care you don't care what kind of vehicle it is see on the, on this one on the the dual baseline you've got an antenna on the front and an antenna on the back and that tells you what your heading is and on my stuff that's the same heading that's coming down on my BNO 55 IMU uh, if I take it off the BNO 85 that one's Converted to the E and E and U, yeah, E and U format. Whereas my BNO fifty five is the NED format. So again, there's more confusion there. But no, this doesn't care about your vehicle at all. It's just taking in uh, the latitude and longitude and a heading from somewhere, whether it's constantly used or not, and that it's just tracking where you are on the face of the earth, and it doesn't care anything about your vehicle. It's just giving you an ODOM. Yes. It gives you the filtered ODOM, so it takes your GPS and and it, it the, everybody keeps saying it cleans it up because remember GPS is noisy and inaccurate because they always they always say that based on a twenty dollar IMU. So now right, they don't have RTK. He's actually running RTK on this, and he if you if you go back to his web page there he's, he's got a little picture that he says here's the results of it. And he's got a little it's like an animated GIF that shows his map as he's driving up and down the block. And then if you if you zoom in real close, down below it says something like the blue dots are the actual GPS data and the yellow dots are one thing and the green dots are something else. And if you look at that, he's basically saying, um, he, he's showing you the input data to his filter and the output data from his filter. And it was, it, I didn't realize that until I, I read the thing below saying the different colored dots are telling you something. So you have to zoom in on that animated GIF to see the dots, but yes, they are indeed, they are indeed there. So somewhere on here. Uh, the big gray map. Yeah, that map right there. And I think if you click on that, it'll it'll just open the image. This is where he's driving. That's where he's driving. Now when he gets right to the top, you'll see there'll be some blue dots. There's some blue dots just showed up right there at the top. Yeah. So he's saying with that stuck on his car and driving up and down the, the neighborhood, that's that's the result he's getting out of it. And this is probably like an out, uh, ODOM message. Let's see, uh, over here he's got uh, on the left, he's saying he's looking at a transform frame and he's looking yeah, at- uh, ODOM. Well, those, those are telling you 
you know, what, what RViz is using as its basis where you can say ODOM or map or something, but he doesn't have a map frame. Right now, I think he's just got the ODOM frame that he's running. So he's got that selected. But then the ones down below is the ones I was curious about where it said, uh, it says NavSat, new display. So he, he's displaying NavSat. So somehow he's displayed his NavSat fixed directly. And that I think is where his blue dots are showing up. Yeah, right there at the color, it shows the blue color. And it'd be nice if, he, if, if it showed a little bit more of what's going on there, but it's also handy to go through somebody's examples like this and look at their RVs and say, what are they displaying? Because that one says TF frame new display. I, I, I don't know if he simply called it that, you know, when you go to the bottom on RVs, you say add and you add a message type. You can add something called TF. I don't know if there's one called TF frame, or he simply added a TF and then renamed that. No, it's not that because TF shows you the little, you know, the, the red, the red, green, blue marker that looks looks like your right hand. It shows that on the screen. So this, this is actually plotting the dots somehow. So so again, there may be something to be learned from just looking at his uh, his uh, his example here of of how you plot this stuff. I noticed at the top there, it says there's a checkbox that says use latest transforms. I, I don't remember seeing that on RViz. And uh, again, it, it, I guess it depends on what version of RViz, which means what version of ROS you're running, whether it has these things or not. Because if I look at the stuff on Kinetic, of course, that's, you know, what, three, three, three versions old. And then my main laptop has no edit loaded on it. And the only thing I do is look at, say, if I run a bag file and watch an RViz. So it could be that I'd have more, more options that I can look at, probably clo match closer to what he what he has here. But this shows his result in MapViz, he says. Oh, that's because he's, oh, may, maybe that is why he's got different topics. But see on the right, that that picture is, I think MapViz is something that loads, it, that, I think it's a plugin for RViz. So that lets you put a map you can go to Google Earth and get the map and put down, and this plots on top of it. So yeah, maybe that's maybe that's why I don't recognize those topics because he's got those are uh, MapViz topics. That says MapViz plus U blocks are too simple. Yeah, he's saying that's what his, his plotted results. That's where they came from. He's got the uh, the are too simple plotting in MapViz is what he's telling you there. And while, while you're right there on that page, that covariance he's showing, this is something that comes right out of the, the F9P driver. And I think on the NEMA NAVSAT driver, they just, they make that up. So they say, if you have a fixed type, if, you're, if your solution type is fixed, they load in one number. If it's a solution type float, they load in a different number. So I, instead of having the, uh, you can see how that moves up and down over time. I think if you look at the the covariance coming out of your driver, I think it's just going to be a step a step function. It's either going to say it's if you have a fixed solution, it's going to be a really good one down close to zero. And then I I think Matt modified one of the drivers. I don't know if it's the one you're running or not, but it, originally it said fix and float were both the same covariance type. And I think he went and modified that. And said well, if it's a float, make it make it somewhere in between the accuracy of a fix and a single point solution. So that, that's just another thing to keep in mind that that driver may not give you a really good covariance out, but I don't know. The only time that matters is if you're trying to use it. So it goes back to the point that <laughs> Ross message has put out a lot of stuff, but I, I assume whatever you're running right now, it doesn't care about that covariance anyway. But when, if you try to run the robot localization, it's very serious about reading up every covariance from every input sensor and doing something with that. So then it would become an issue if you're trying to uh, trying to run that. And if you look at this, I mean, what do you think about a covariance of, you know, let's just say that's 0 .00, 0 0.01 up here. Point zero one yeah let's just say this is point zero one so i believe what that's trying to tell you is uh the label down there says position covariance zero that's either your x covariance or your y covariance and what that's telling you is that's how how good of a solution it thinks it has where zero is is the best solution and 
it, it turns out the covariance is actually the value squared. So if you take the square root of whatever whatever number you see here, that's what the GPS thinks it's putting out. Uh, that, that's how accurate it thinks it is at that point in time. Right. And I, I'm, I'm, do you happen to know off the top of your head if RTK is, is fixed the best? I've forgotten. Um, is all of this fixed? RTK fix, I'm assuming. I'm assuming that too. And what's the threshold to lose fix? Do you have any idea? Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if, if those are directly related to each other or not. It's just if you lose fix, then your covariance number is going to jump up. And so it's not, it's not as though it's using the covariance, but it could be in, in, inside the GPS. It may actually be looking at its, uh, covariance to determine that, but I don't know. I, I was thinking covariance is generated after the fact based on lots of things, but I, I don't know. No, I was, I was as usual, more simple and thinking this, if this got to point one, then it was no longer fixed. It was float and whatever, and thinking it was that simple, but maybe I, not. I think what you have to do, you have to look at the status coming out of your uh, GPS receiver, or or in this case, the the status published by your NEMA Navsat driver, and there are there there is one status field in there that does, I but I, that that's one one I found when I was looking at mine, it it either put out a zero or a two, a two being a fix and zero being not a fix, and I I modified mine or I I found a different output from my receiver that'll tell me whether it's a fix or a float or a single point or no no solution at all but i think the one coming out of the neiman navsat driver either says it's fixed or it's not fixed is is all that's telling you there hmm. and what was the other thing i was going to say there um and i it, it turns out that both of the drivers were calculated the same way they, they looked at some status coming out of the gps and they said you had a fix or not a fix so that's why I, on mine, I went to a, a different message coming out where I could find that information. And actually, if you go to the actual NEMA sentences, um, I don't, I'm not sure which one it is. One, one of the, the two or three standard ones in there, they have a field that says fix type or solution type or something. And that I believe that NEMA stuff does actually distinguish between a fix and a float and something else. They have, they have what they call DGPS, which I think means it's a, a single point, but they're using like the, uh, the, the correction data off the satellite. That's what they call SBAS. And I've never, once I went to RTK, I don't care about that crap anymore. I just, I know either I have an RTK fix or RTK float, or it's, it's not working well enough to use. The, the other point I was gonna make, so if you go look at the, uh, the GPS odom.py program, Matt stuck a thing in there that said, uh, look at your fixed type, and the fixed type is not a two. It prints out a message saying, "Oh, warning! You you don't have your fixed type accurate." And the next line down says, "If if it's not a type two, it just ignores it completely. The substitute zeros in there." And I commented those lines out on mine because number one, I didn't want to uh, plug it up in my log file saying I don't have a fix because you know you let it sit there for a couple of minutes, and then you will have a fix, and everybody's happy. But the other thing is, I was driving around in a square. And I noticed it dropped from a fix to a float for just like a second or two. And all of a sudden my plot jumped back to my zero zero reference point for however many samples that that wasn't that wasn't coming in. So I, I said, go ahead and, and generate the solution regardless of whatever's coming in on mine. And I don't know if that's the right thing to do or not. But as far as plotting, then I can see what see what's going on there. And that's where the whole thing about it puts out a, a, a fixed type of two, and then I had to track all that down to find out why I was putting that out and where that was coming from. <clears throat> and before you tell me you're going to go out and buy yet more GPS, I I wouldn't. I would I would use what you have. Yeah, I and I plan to. I'm just they. I just saw though an ad about. And you mentioned bands. Um, 
if you go to the Slack channel, I put in random, I put the link to their, what they call the the simple R2K3B. So it's the newer yeah. one that uses a different chipset. And it looks like it has some fabulous. So it's right, since you're on their website, you can probably, I don't know how you got the starter kits, uh, either products or news. Just click on news and they should say, here's, here's our new one. Triple band. Yeah, there you go. And they claim you can get down like seven millimeters of accuracy with that one. But if you look at the prices, you can see it. You can see it's a lot more expensive now to get the, uh, to get that. And that's just for one unit. Yes. And you would need. Now the one, the one on the right, that one has the heading built in and it's not, it's not twice the price, which if you get the other ones, it's, it's going to be twice the price to get their two modules, put them together. This one just has built into that chip. It'll do the dual heading stuff, but that, that's way more money than I want to spend. And you go look at the antennas. The antennas are now $200, so they raise the price of those too. So it's going to be $800 or $1,000 to get one of these two solutions. Plus, But you would need this on the rover, and you would need this for the base station. If, if you're doing your own base station, yes. Right. And, because... my, and my thought was, yeah, it'd be great to have all that, but... You know, I feel that what I have now is going to be more than adequate for my playing around that I'm doing. So, and I don't have I don't have a lot of extra spending cash anymore. So I I'm, yeah, do, I'm done buying toys. And I'm trying to understand then from your perspective, this on the rover and this is a base station versus. Uh, You know, a basin rover kit. Does either one of these have headings? Assume one of these has. Does this have heading? Uh, no, but if you look on, just keep scrolling down there, uh, right there, RTK heading. So that's, you'd need that much stuff to put on a rover, which got the baseboard and the little, little board that plugs in on top, and then the two antennas. So you get this for the rover, and then you need another. You still need another one for a base station. You need another one for like yes. yes, this for a base station. Yes. What's fundamentally different between, you know, this is a base station, this on the rover versus that three jobby that we just looked at? Because the newer one is now triple band instead of dual band. And it's simply a different chipset on the board from somebody else that uh, their, their parts apparently just work much better than the U-Block stuff at a, at a higher cost. Oh, it's no longer U-Blocks. No, it's Sep Septrino or something is what the, what the uh, chipset is. And it turns out between the two uh, boards, whether it's a single heading or whether, whether it gives you the heading or not, that, that, that's actually two different chips they put on the board. So if you get the one that's just the base station or a rover without heading, then it's one chip. And then if you get the one that's that's the, the one that shows two connectors on the board, that's actually a different chip on the board that's meant to do the dual dual antenna. Okay, see red top says Sept Septin Trio is the, the name of the, the chip. Yeah, yeah. The, the chip they put on the board. And again, I'm gonna say don't run out and buy one of these just no, because just because it's a new toy. I was just, I just, when I saw triple, I'm like, what, what, what? Um, do you, do you still have your original, you, you got what, the ComNav, is that what your stuff's called? You, you bought a new one of those, do you still have the original boards for that? I do, it's in Texas. Because you could, um, that, that sh stuff should all be close enough. You you could put two two receivers on your lawn tractor and do this dual antenna static heading. And then you, so since you got a total of four boards, you could put two of them on your rover and then one as your base station. And you could get the, uh, since, since you've already got the parts anyway. Although since you, since you have it, say one set in Texas and one set where you are now, you know, that that's probably more valuable to you. So you don't have to drag the stuff back and forth. <clears throat> I was wondering about that because but then I heard somebody say, oh, well, then you have timing issues about trying to 
merge that stuff. So um, now it could be that if you go look at your documentation, that it's see U Blocks has this built right in. You just simply say turn on this moving baseline. It says okay, here you go, and it gives you a heading out of it. And it could be that the boards you have, they're just an option somewhere that says put the second one in moving baseline, and and it would just magically generate this heading for you. Otherwise, what you can do, you can put both receivers in RTK mode, and then pull up the your lat your your x y from each one. And you can do the, your own calculations to figure out, you know, based on you know you got one of them right here and the other one up here. Then based on the angle here, you just take the arc tangent of the difference between those two, and that will give you that will give you your heading angle out of it. Now I I remember when uh, the guys in uh, New Zealand uh, what was it that he was Walter Walter too. He said they had bought two of the RGU simple boards and they were doing it that way where they had them both set to RTK and they're doing their own calculations. And I said, oh, you can just go in and turn on this mode and it will do it itself. And he said, yeah, that that seemed to work much better than what they had. And he maybe said it worked better than what they had. And he was he was translating from what his software guys had told him, I think. But but you can indeed do it with just two two RTK receivers. You could do that. But you're better off if the the manufacturer gave you the option to just say turn on an option and let them do the calculations for you because they actually know what they're doing and they might look at something other than just simply your two positions. They might be looking at phase differences and rotational velocities and all kinds of all kinds of extra fun stuff. So mm -hmm. that's that's another that's another thing to to consider. Oh, another thing you might want to look at. Uh, sometime when you're you're bored and have nothing better to do, pull up your manual for your 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 GPS receivers and see. Doesn't sure, have... I just want to drive an AB line, Jeff? I'm, I'm, I just want to it, drive an AB. While you're in there, look to see does it have like wheel odometry input into the thing? Because the more expensive ones will have that. It'll have like a, a pin or something on the board, or or you can send them messages. So basically, you take the the counts off your back wheels and feed it into your GPS, and that it's doing some of that that sensor fusion for you directly inside of the GPS and giving you a better result. Now, you might have to pay a lot more money to have that automatically switched between GPS and wheel odometry, but, but you, you can actually correct your GPS if it knows that you're moving forward or you're moving at some angle. I think that makes your GPS, the, you know, it somehow it fuses that and gives you a better GPS reading out of that. So if you just happen to notice that, and I was going to look up the U-Blocks ones. I don't recall if it's got uh, that built in or not. It, it, somewhere in the documentation is, oh, if you have this receiver, or this receiver, or this receiver, you know, you got all these different options. And I don't know if the one that I have, the common one, will take in any kind of wheel odometry information or not. Yeah, I um, see what... Uh, mine was um, it was it's um, a knockoff Novatel, and I don't think I spent time to. Uh, I'm pulling up with the manual, um, trying to figure out which one of these would be the best one to pull up. Well, I, I think various receivers will have that option, but I think most people just ignore it. If they're sitting around, if they're really bored sitting around, hey, hey, we should try that. It could be that, you know, they could, whatever receivers they have, they could make it do more, more wonderful things. But in here, just search for wheel and see if it says, finds anything. Come on. And this goes back to the point, if you have enough money, you can buy an actual GPS receiver that has, it does GPS and it has the, uh, the wheel odometry input and it's got an IMU and it'll do everything for you that everybody's always trying to do with Ross. So people take a GPS and your IMU and your wheel odometry and feed it through these fancy Kalman filters. You could actually, if you got enough money, 
and you can just buy a GPS receiver that does everything for you already and just says you are here and that. But again, that you usually have to spend quite a lot of money to, uh, to get that. And like yeah. on the U, the U block stuff might say, oh yeah, some of the receivers will do that, but then you, you have to go track down to see which one, which one you have and see if it actually, actually works or not. So I'm just thinking the, your manual there, I don't recall that saying all oh, this covers six or seven different devices. That, that gets real ugly. You, you look at the Novotel stuff and you pull up their manual and it says, oh yeah, you can do this. Then in fine for instance, if you have this particular model and it turns out that's never seems to be the model that you, uh, that you have. And I don't, I don't think you should spend a lot of time on it right now trying to, trying to find that or, or try, to, try to use it because what you have is giving you a perfectly decent uh, location out of the thing at the moment. Yeah, I've been happy with it. Um, but my issue is time, getting time to uh, spend on it and then getting my head back into it and then anyway so um, deploying your calculation for um, I'm going to call it rotational velocity but it's not but that's just what I know it by um, and then changing my low level code is my next step So I think my next step is to do more endless searching for stuff that I'll probably no, never use. No, no, no. And, I, I, and I might put on my list to try out that blog that Matt Sadowski did, since it should be very close to what I have already. I just have to fire up his uh, all of his files. I might, so I might get around to trying that. And then I somehow want to figure out, you know, if I I, I need to go out and and run a new data set. Because because this other one that I found, if 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 I find that, I'll post that to uh, to the random channel. It's it's where the guy was saying, well, his odometry doesn't line up, and he says, well, it's not supposed to because of the way Ross works. And they were telling him, you know, do a data set where you drive in a drive in a square, and then by by doing that, you can go look at the direction everything is going. So I should go out and make a plot like that and start off and say, point it, do one and point it north and drive in a square. And then shut that down and then point it east and drive in a square. So I've got two data sets showing me the two different things. And then I can look at those on RViz or whatever and see what it where it thinks it's going. When are you? I'm trying to get back to a blog post. Um, come on, come on, come on. Uh, Slack is really painful sometimes. Probably be easier just to um, say when do you ever hope to try to run an run a simple navigational command? Well, probably. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll put some stuff together to try it, but I'll probably find somewhere other than my front yard to test that because I don't have enough room to turn the thing loose and, and watch it doing stupid things. So I, I either need to find a parking lot or one of the local parks. Now, if I take it to a local park, I know somebody's going to call the cops and say, I've got a motorized vehicle in the, the park. But, 
but I need to find somewhere that's big enough that the first time I run it, you know, it doesn't immediately run into the house or run into the neighbor's cars or run out in the middle of the street. So that, that's another thing I have to consider if I want to get that far. Yeah, 2D nav goal. That's what I was trying to, that's the language I was trying to get to. I mean, that, that's what I, way back when, five months ago, do you believe that? Dag, nab it. Five months ago, I tried a 2D nav go and it all fell apart. And now here I am still trying to get back to that point. Uh, the other thing I just noticed was I, I should keep track of where the little uh, icons of, of people's faces are on the screen because when it gets recorded and played back, that can over overlap things. And I just now moved it from one side to the other. You probably can't see that right now, but when you if you go back and watch the video, you can see that I, I start moving stuff around. So I, I I try to get this list of things that I should be doing, and we'll we'll see what happens. Another thing I, I just posted to the chat the chat channel i posted a test message because i don't know if if i don't save the chat and i end the meeting does it automatically save that to my directory so this will be a test for that number one I'd, I'd saved a version of the chat out and copied it somewhere else so when i shut this down number one do i have chat chat text in there and number two does that test message show up because i haven't saved anything with that on there so that's just another test i'm going to do here because I don't know if it saves it. And if I don't save it, you know, since we had valid valid links in there this time, I'll, I, I definitely want to save it. So it's just another, another thing that's hard to uh, determine if it's going to work or not. If it doesn't if it doesn't save it on yours, it probably saves it on mine. So uh, I, I will have it as well. <clears throat> and if it doesn't automatically save it somewhere, that's just one more thing to remember every time to uh, to do that. So. 2D nav go, Jeff. 2D nav go. Okay, I'll I'll think about that. <laughs> and I'm I'm gonna stop the recording now.